Um, and we are uh, allowing ample time for questions and answers. So as, as we progress through this presentation, please make a note of your questions or put them in the chat if you um, don't wanna forget them. And then we will address them at the end. So, by the way, I'm Jennifer Young. I'm with Michigan Interfaith Power and Light, and I am also joined by Leah Wistie, who is our executive director, and she is with us here. Hi, um, I just wanted, to, <laughs> just wanted to give you a chance to get to know us. So our mission is to inspire and equip people of faith and conscience to exercise stewardship and love for all creation. We were founded in 2002 is a religious response to global warming. We have engaged with 300 member congregations, but we know of at least 1500 congregations across the state we have engaged with. And but they represent really diverse faith traditions and denominations. Um, so we believe that the climate crisis is a moral and spiritual issue. Um, and that's what brings us to engaging with Solar Faithful. Um, and just to provide a bit of context for how we think about our work and where solar falls into this equation, we, we think of our work as a three-legged stool, meaning there are three different approaches that we can, we can implement to make systemic change. One of them is the practical actions like the building projects and your solar projects at your place of worship. But just as important is unifying your voice as people of faith, um, because you do have that power to make systemic change with our legislators voting or meeting with legislators on policy issues. And then spiritual relationship based, how are you bringing creation care into your ministry? We want to hear about all of those ways. So. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Leah to talk about why solar as an approach to climate change and, and addressing the climate crisis. Hey, everybody. Um, glad to be with you. So I think um, I think the the biggest reason for considering solar as a part of your congregation. Um, I don't have a particular slide about this concept, but I wanted to introduce you to it if you don't know it already. Um, it's called the Honorable Harvest, and it's something I learned from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who you might know as the author of Braiding Sweetgrass. She's um, an indigenous woman, scientist, um, you know, weaver of traditional knowledge and Western scientific knowledge. Um, but the idea is um, we harvest in a way that minimizes harm, whether we're harvesting sweet grasses from the land or whether we're harvesting energy, right? If we can harvest it from the sun, that is a clean, life-supporting way to do it. And if we are stuck in patterns of harvesting only from fossil fuels, we know that these are ways that are destructive, that are deeply destructive ways of doing it. And so a program like Solar Faithful um, helps your congregation perform an honorable harvest, right? Share the bounty of earth and leave something for the rest. Next slide, please. Um, so Michigan IPL is based in the city of Detroit, and so I have a couple of images just from stuff around here, climate impacts that we've experienced, but you probably have similar examples where you are. We had two, at least two, you know, quote unquote, 500 year floods um, in the past decade, and we're experiencing more frequent and more destructive storms, which leaves us with power outages, right? Um, next slide. Basements have flooded. Um, the picture on the right, um, I think that's in, a, in an east side neighborhood of the city of Detroit. I drove down that street and every single house had a pile like this in front of it because um, everyone's basement was flooded. They lost furniture, mementos, appliances, all of these things. It's a lot to recover from. Next slide. Um, and we even had, you know, last summer this 
to me, surprising climate impact, which was Canadian wildfire smoke. Um, I had thought that, well, I don't live in California, so <laughs> at least at least I won't have to deal with wildfire smoke. Um, and then the tw summer of 2023 changed that. Next slide. Um, and even if it's not wildfire driven, right, of course, pollution, um, this is something that you know, in, in the city of Detroit, especially zip code 48217, which has the worst air quality in the whole state, um, this is a pollution matter as well. So climate pollution and air pollution are, are going hand in hand and they adversely affect the most vulnerable, people of color, people with fewer resources, elders, um, people with health issues, all of that stuff. Next slide. So that's that's just my quick recap of, hey, why does this matter? Um, and now I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer and she's going to talk about some of some of what Solar Faithful has to offer. Absolutely. So, you know, just to piggyback on why solar matters, the cost of electricity is going up every year, especially if you, like most of our faith communities across the state, rely on your utility provider for electricity. The, um, this graph is based on uh, a 3.5% 3, 3 increase in utility rates annually. Um, and it's showing that over the course of the next 25 years, your congregation would, in this, in this hypothetical scenario, but this is based on a real congregation, um, would be spending over $280,000 just on electricity alone. However, if you, go with the solar faithful model, um, which we will talk more about in something called a power purchase agreement, you spend 216,000 on your electricity through the solar energy generation. So you're saving over $64,000 with your solar panels on average about $2,500 a year. Um, but we wanted to kind of step back for a minute and just kind of understand we do hear from congregations all around the state that they want to go solar but why aren't they um why aren't there more houses of worship that we have examples of so houses of worship have some unique challenges the first is access to capital so for a congregation that is spending all of its dollars in its mission and ministry especially if you have a food pantry, a soup kitchen, you really don't have any extra dollars to put to um, something that doesn't immediately serve the community. So access to capital is, is a barrier and Solar Faithful addresses that by providing that through a partnership with an impact investor. Um, the second barrier is understanding that technology. So, Solar technology has evolved rapidly over the last few years. And in addition to that, um, it is um, not a field that necessary, necessarily every facilities director or trustee has spent hours and hours trying to understand. So again, this is something that Solar Faithful addresses by the fact that you can lean into the, the years of technical expertise that our team offers. The third barrier is oftentimes congregations have a roof that has to be replaced before solar is a viable opportunity. For example, if the solar is gonna last 25 years, but your roof only lasts the next five years, then you wanna consider a roof replacement first. So Solar Faithful addresses that by providing you with a, a team that has expertise and a successful experience helping congregations fold the the, um, the cost of the roof replacement into the cost of the solar project. And therefore the, the tax credits that apply to the solar can also be applied to the roof. Um, we'll talk more about that. Every situation is different, but this is definitely something that we can work with you on. And then the, the fourth barrier that we're, we wanted to call to your attention is the importance of a trusted messenger. So we we know that for faith-based organizations, the biggest motivation motivating factor of moving forward 
would be seeing that your peers are doing something in this vein. So um, the more that we have phase examples who are bearing witness to their climate values, um, the bigger an impact that that will make. So I wanted to introduce you to Solar Faithful. This is a collaborative initiative. Michigan IPL is proud to be a founding member along with the Climate Witness Project who Steve, who's joining us today represents. Um, and then a solar developer, um, House of Energy, who Rob rep represents. And we've partnered with a impact investor called SunWealth and they're allowing for um, the entire cost of the solar project to be covered up front for houses of worship. So our real goal is to help congregations be leaders in rising to the challenge of addressing the climate crisis. We just wanted to give you some real life examples of congregations who've gone solar and starting off with Trinity AME that uh, partnered with Solar Faithful and installed solar this past fall. And we are privileged to have Henderson Botterford, a trustee with Trinity, joining us to share about their experience. So I'm wondering, Henderson, if you would be able to share about that experience. Sure. Um, well, we, we uh, started our endeavor with solar uh, panels back in uh, 2022. Uh, and the reason that that happened was because uh, we had just finished a project at our church um, uh, getting um, all LED lighting put in uh, th throughout the church. And so I had, a, I personally had an interest in maybe trying to get some solar panels somehow. And uh, there was a, a, one of our members sits on a board of a community center and they were having a solar panel dedication um, in a couple of weeks from when we finished our project with the lights. And our pastor asked me to go. I guess she was, her, her schedule was full. And so she asked me to go. And first of all, I do sit on, on the board uh, at the church, our trustee board. And we um, uh, pretty much make the decisions as to what we're going to do with our building. So I did attend that um, dedication ceremony. And at the dedication ceremony, I, I did some networking and I met uh, a lot of people uh, that had interest in uh, solar panels and some people that I had worked with in the past. And so I met a gentleman uh, that was, um, that owned any, he, he worked for an electrical company, but it was in Jackson, Michigan. And so he and I talked and um, so he, he wanted to give us a bid on the on a, on the lights, and um, so I told him, "Yeah, well, maybe, let me go back a, a little bit." We had not gotten the lights installed. We were, I, were get, I was getting bids to get the lights installed, so he said that he would be interested in giving us a bid to get those lights um, installed. So a couple of phone calls, um, and uh, he came over. He went through the church. I, I didn't ever get a bid from him on the lights, but he did tell me, because with the conversation came up again about solar panels, he did tell me that he had heard of uh, a company in Muskegon, Michigan, that worked with uh, faith-based um, institutions and getting solar panels at no cost. So, of course, I was interested in that because our church is kind of financially strapped. So I was interested in that, and I asked him if he could put me in touch with a, uh, someone from that um, organization. And he said that he would. He would get a phone number for me. Well, a couple of weeks went by. And he, I didn't get a phone number. And then about three weeks uh, or so, he did call me and give me a phone number and uh, gave me a name, and that name was Rob Rafson. And the phone number was for, the, for, was for Rob. And so the very same day, I made a phone call to Rob. And uh, we had a good conversation, and I explained to him my interest in solar panels and uh, uh, about gave him some history about our church and uh, told him about the church, and we he got some information. And he said he would uh, look into it. So a couple of weeks went by, and uh, he did get back with me and said he thought that our church would be a good candidate for solar panels. So that's where the 
project started. And from there, we moved forward. We're getting the solar panels installed. And we were hoping that we could get the panels done um, by the end of the year, that before the real hard winter hit. Well, that didn't happen. Now, there were some issues going on. And uh, Rob would know more about those because he was a catalyst behind this. And so I think some of those issues were uh, supply chain issues and things like that. So we went on and got in past the winter. And uh, uh, I was, Rob, by this time, had an assistant. And so uh, Emily had sent me an, uh, an email stating that the project should start in about two months. And so in the meantime, during the winter, uh, I was in constant contact with Rob and all of the things that he were requesting um, about the church I would get for him. And he sent me a contract uh, about, <clears throat> he had explained to me about the power purchase agreement. And so I thought that it was a, a, a good opportunity for us. And uh, so I did uh, read the contracts, had a couple of attorneys look at the contract and blah, blah, blah. And so, and I introduced it to the board and got the board's approval, got the pastor's approval. And so we were moving forward with it. And so uh, we didn't get, actually get the project started as far as putting the panels on the, on the roof until around the end of May of 23. So by the 1st of June or so, they had completed the installation of the panels, uh, but the inverters were not uh, in yet. And so after we waited for a while, the inverters came in and the electricians installed those. And we were pretty much set to, to, to turn those on uh, by probably mid-August. But we wanted to have a dedication ceremony at the church. And so we set a date for September 24th. And we had Rob uh, come over and, and visit, and Jennifer came over and visit for the solar pan panel dedication. And some of those, that picture that you're seeing on the screen now was at that after that dedication uh, that day. That's our pastor on the left and our presiding elder in the, in the center and his wife. Uh, the presiding elder of the district came down and he gave a, a message that day. And then we had a little dedication ceremony afterwards. And so that's kind of how we got the solar panels. It was all because the pastor had asked me to go to this dedication ceremony. And it was a very small community center. I think they had maybe one or two panels on their, on their roof. So, uh, but nevertheless, I was able to do some networking and meet some people. And uh, I also met some people from Solar Faith and uh, had talked to some of those people. And that kind of got me going. I, if I had not gotten a number from this gentleman, I probably would have tried to go through Solar Faithful initially uh, on my own. But <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to get this phone number for Rob Rapson. And Rob was a, a godsend as far as getting these panels done. He did all of the work. He was easy to work with. And... Uh, Whenever we had issues, he would let me know, and he kept me abreast of the project. And we kind of moved forward and got the project done in about a year. And we have now have a 25.9 kilowatt system, which consists of, I think, about 40 to 44 panels. And we haven't had any problems since they were installed. Uh, no issues at all. And uh, there's been, I haven't had any any reason to call Rob because we haven't had any issues there just sitting there and uh, uh, creating energy from the sun. And so it was a good thing for us and it gave us a chance to kind of get give back to our green earth and try, try to go green as much as possible. And um, so that's kind of where we are with that. And I've been working with Jennifer uh, since that uh, installation and we've been talking about and trying to figure out a way as to how we might be able to replace our heating and cooling systems at our church. Uh, we have a 60 year old boiler in our church, so we'd like to try and get that replaced. And so we, I'm in conversations with Jennifer and she's been my, being my lead on this as to how we might be able to manage this and uh, not have to pay for it up front. So that's kind of how they, 
my story as far as how that uh, the solar panels came about for Trinity. Thank you so much, Henderson. We want to um, give folks a chance to ask you questions at the end, but we just we wanted to provide a few more slides to explain how Solar Faithful works. Would you be able to hang on for a few more minutes? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes, but let us know. Okay, um, so moving to the next slide here. Um, this is another example of a congregation that very recently had solar installed. Um, actually visited and took these photos last month. So this is Green Sky Hill Indian United Methodist Church and they participated with Solar Faithful um, and I think their system is 17.2 kilowatts. We haven't had a chance to evaluate the energy savings because they have so much solar now, they are able to um, nearly electrify their building, completely get off of grid powered electricity, um, aside from some backup um, propane in case of emergency. Um, but it's really exciting the possibilities it opens up for them to um, try some really innovative heat pump technology that are getting installed. You can see the solar panels there on top of Susan Hall, which is their fellowship hall. Um, and just a few other examples because, you know, we need to see more examples and know that this is a norm. I mean, we need to create a new story about who owns and accesses clean energy. So we just wanted to share right here in our home state of Michigan, here's some congregations leading the way. Um, this is Jesuit Catholic Church and School in Detroit. Um, they got one grant for just a few thousand dollars. It was like three or five thousand dollar grant to, to tell a story about um, how they're greening their congregation. And they use that to um, build the momentum for getting more solar panels and get more grants. But here the uh, student and their solar club says, hey, this is important because 20% of Michigan citizens have asthma, 27% of Detroiters, and 40% of our own solar school club. So this is bringing it home why it's important to move to alternative sources of energy. And then Pastor Kelvin Glass with Lord of Lords Ministries in Detroit on the east side installed a ground mounted system um, just outside of the church in the parking lot. Um, and this just this just went live a few months ago. And um, this is $69,000 over 30 years that the congregation will save and $93,000 not paid to DTE. We are excited that they are the first black church in Detroit to go solar. And that's uh, due to a program that, that Leah shepherded through called Positive Energy. Um, that is really a kind of pilot project, but it's another way for congregations to go solar. Um, and then we just wanted to call out other opportunities. If you're not ready to like go all in with solar for your entire worship facility, we would love for you to engage however you do. And there are several congregations who have engaged with us through what we have, we call the Carbon Fund. So the Ann Arbor Friends Meeting, which are um, Quakers in Ann Arbor, self-elect tax themselves on their own carbon emissions, which is pretty amazing. But anyway, they put that into a fund with Michigan IPL called the Carbon Fund. Every year, this fund enables one or two faith communities and low-income communities to implement an energy saving project. And so here's a couple of examples. Uh, Pilgrim Baptist Church in Detroit, which has um, food for the soul, soup, uh, food pantry. They installed two solar powered LED lights to illuminate the entrance of their food distribution center. And then where um, is standing with the mic, this is actually the parking lot of Lord of Lord Ministries. And in the upper right hand corner is the street light, which is the only picture of a their parking lot light that I could actually find. So sorry, it's not very evident, but they got um, they got such a high bill from their really outdated um, 
energy consuming parking lot lights that the pastor called DTE and had them taken out. That was great. They had no bill, but they also had no light and congregations coming to Bible study on Wednesday nights were afraid to even come. And the pastor said, I've got to do something. So when he heard about the carbon fund with Michigan IPL, he applied. He got eight solar powered LED parking lot lights that now illuminate the parking lot of Lord of Lords. And um, these are just some examples of projects that this fund um, can support. So I just wanted to explain really briefly how um, Solar Faithful provides benefits to faith communities who want to go solar. There's no upfront cost. Um, maintenance is provided for the 25 year life of the, the lease, which is what we're referring to as the power purchase agreement and savings guarantee of 10% on the cost of electricity compared to what you would have been paying if you continued business as usual with the utility. Um, this is probably actually too much detail, but this is to give you some understanding of power purchase agreement. Again, it's a 25 year lease. Um, you have the opportunity to take title of the system at no cost after the life, after the, that 25 years. Um, or you can just continue with the power purchase agreement or you can have the solar panels removed. So there are, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, and we will definitely work with you to create an, an agreement that you are comfortable with. It also includes, let's say for example, the, um, the you know that the roof is only gonna last 10 or 15 more years. You're not really ready to replace it right now, but it's pretty clear that they will have, the solar panels will have to be removed within the 25 year life of the power purchase agreement Solar Faithful will cover that um, removal and replacement of the solar panels at no cost to you. And this is just a kind of graphic that explains the process from beginning to end. So there's filling out an interest form and in the initial savings, sending in your electric bills so that we can give you a general sense of how much electricity your worship facility needs and therefore how much solar you would need. And then that allows us to um, talk about financing options with you um, and present different models that um, you can consider. And once you decide to move forward, you would sign a contract with us and then the solar implementation would begin. And you will see the savings and we'll, we, we will do a follow-up within three to six months to let you know this is how much we're seeing that you're actually saving um, compared to the estimate to make sure that the, the system is performing as expected. So I also wanted to call out why this is exciting at this moment in time is because of new legislation passed in the Inflation Reduction Act that for the first time ever enables nonprofits and therefore houses of worship to apply for and receive tax credit. So how does a non-tax paying credit not non-taxing institution actually achieve tax benefits well it's through something called direct or elective pay in this legislation so you are eligible for a minimum of 30 percent tax credit on your solar panels um but you could get up to 60 percent through all these adders one the first 10 percent is from domestic materials if you elect to choose solar faithful as your solar installer which you don't have to through our program we will definitely connect you with uh, the solar installer of your choice. But um, Solar Faithful does buy all domestically manufactured materials, so you would get that 10%. Um, another is called a low income bonus. So this is, um, this is their specific guidelines that the IRS um, has. So you could tell if you're in what's considered a low income community, it relates to the unemployment rate and other factors. Yeah, you have to apply while funds last. It is a, a, a lottery system and there's also a window. So last year it ran out pretty fast. They tripled the size of it this year because they didn't want that to happen, but still it's relatively new. We don't know how long these funds will last. And then the last is for what's called a clean energy community. If you're in a community that's been adversely affected by the closure of coal fired plants or some other fossil fuel related industry and 
therefore, um, this could be a way of creating clean energy jobs to replace that loss, you get another 10%. And again, there are maps so that you know whether or not your community falls um, in these areas. So next steps are really simple. If you're just at all interested in exploring it, you fill out the interest form and we will send that out in a follow-up email. It's also on our website, solarfaithful.org. And then we'll need your electric bills so that we can just give you a general sense of how much electricity you're using and how much solar you would need. Um, if you are a DTE customer, we will need 12 full months of bills. If you're in consumer's energy for electric, only one bill and all other utilities as applicable, we'll work with you to help you know how many bills we need. Um, and then you can always contact us. Our information is on our website, michiganipl.org slash energy. It's also here. And we just wanted to say thank you so much for your time. And with that, be able to open it up for questions, comments. We really wanna hear from you. Um, what are your key takeaways? What are your thoughts? Yes, Carolyn, we will. We are recording it so we can share back out to everyone who registered for this meeting. Well, maybe to help get the conversation going, um, I'm wondering, like, Henderson, I'm interested to hear more about your, you, you shared a lot about how you got to the point of doing the solar, and I wonder if you have, you know, like, what would you say to a congregation who's considering solar, um, words of advice, thoughts on solar faithful? Well, solar, excuse me, solar faithful has been great to work with. And I, I would encourage if, if you're thinking about a, a solar panels for your congregation, for your house of worship, <clears throat> I would <clears throat> highly encourage you to move forward with it. Uh, <clears throat> the right people are here to uh, get in contact with that will assist you with it. And uh, once you get in touch with the right people, uh, my main source was Rob in the beginning. <clears throat> and I've since been in contact with Jennifer quite, quite often. But those two people would be the, uh, the contact people if you're interested to go ahead and move forward with it. Uh, we um, did not realize that, that even though it was explained in the in the in the purchase power agreement, I guess I was I didn't quite understand as far as uh, the amount that you're going to save. So I was looking for a little more than the savings that we're getting, but we are getting some savings, and over time that savings will uh, accumulate to quite a lot for not having any investment as far as capital in, in the solar panels. So I think it's a, a, a great way to go. And you're, like I said, you're trying to, you're getting away from fossil fuels and uh, adding a little bit, doing your, your little part as far as uh, trying to make the air better that we breathe. And so, I, I don't have any uh, regrets for, for doing it because we didn't, at, as of this date, we have not spent not one dime on this system. And so for us to have a system that we have not spent any money on, we have not had to invest in anything, I think it's a great way to go for anyone that, that's looking to try and save some money and uh help to get away from fossil fuels in the future. Thank you so much for sharing that, Henderson. I'm seeing um, I'm seeing a note in the chat, um, a question, a, probably a Rob question. Um, so Sajad asks, how is the system sized to cover 100% of electricity needs? I don't know, Rob, if we could talk about Trinity AME's example as well as more generally. Yeah, I think that there's really two big factors that uh, uh, we have, like um, Green Sky Hill, where their um, mission to be 100% renewable, they decided to go with 100%, even though um, 
that's not the highest and best return on investment. So mm -hmm. what, what we found is that the utilities, your electric bill is around, say, 18 cents a kilowatt hour. But for any excess energy, like happens during the summer, that would only be credited at around 12 cents. So what we do is design for about 70% of your electric usage so that there isn't so much um, excess energy sold during the summer. And that ends up with, um, with a, a good economics, whether or not you purchase the system or if you um, um, go with a PPA. So, yeah, so what I think I heard just to try, it's a lot to take in. So to try to reflect that back, um, it sounds like Solar Faithful is open to sizing a system to be 100% meeting your electricity needs. However, um, if return on investment is your key concern, you might actually go for a smaller system because of the um, extractive way that our, as investor owned utilities compensate us for energy we put back on the grid. Exactly right. Um, so another question from Sajad, um, if a facility wants to shift some of their heating from gas to electric, like adding a heat pump, can that be included in the system or credits? Um, yes, we would size the system for after you've electrified, after you've gone from natural gas to electric, like a heat pump and such. And, um, and that would be then your uh, your total usage, and we would size from there. Um, there are credits that are included in the um, for electrification for going with a heat pump, and that's sort of a separate incentive. But if there's any special electrical need, like an electrical upgrade that would be needed for going to electrify, that can then be captured as one with the incentives for sure. And so will Solar Faithful help with the electrification process? Um, yeah, we can we can support you on that. Um, it, we're not a HVAC contractor. We would work with the um, the the organization to then make sure we're doing the best with the incentives available. And and then also sizing the solar system correctly. We'll also, if you want, we'll also integrate a EV charger and uh, include that in the project as well. Mm. That's a cool offer. I know a lot of congregations are interested in that. Carolina, you up. Okay, I have a question. This is really interesting, first of all. Thank you for doing this. Um, I was, this question isn't directly related to solar panels, but it kind of wraps into it, I'd say. Um, I was wondering whether you um, are able to suggest resources or whether you do any of this in terms of a congregation figuring out its environmental footprint so that we kind of know overall where we are and what we need to work on to get to a more carbon neutral position. And obviously solar paneling would have a lot, lot to do with that. Right. I think I think that we could probably help some in terms of looking at your gas and electric bill and then comparing that against uh, a similar sized building and therefore determine what's, um, you know, what's your carbon footprint now and what would it be after? Okay. Thanks. I, we also, are, so Michigan IPL is connected to the National Interfaith Power and Light Organization. And I believe they have a carbon footprint calculator that's designed for use by congregations. There's a lot of them out there, but usually they're for like an individual household. Um, but if I can find that link, I will put that in the chat, how I found it. Hmm. 
Yeah, and I also just put in the link to our energy resources page, um, which kind of just basically says, first start with the free utility energy audits um, and consider other opportunities for saving your saving on energy, like the Energy Star for congregations guide and things like that. Thank you, Leah. That's great. Yeah. Peter. My computer had a glitch, so I missed, missed part of the presentation. So if this is redundant, you know, let me know. Okay. But uh, we live in a community that has a, a municipally owned power plant has a reputation for being a very low rate uh, mm -hmm. for electric billing. And I'm wondering if there are scenarios in which it would not be possible to get a PPA that could guarantee 10%. Rob, what do you think? Um, great question. Um, there are some uh, especially municipal utilities, there are some places where the project doesn't pencil. And what we're working on now is to is to uh, match up projects with some grant money and and then they become viable so that we can uh, partic have everybody participate. So we're still working on some of the smaller details on that, but we're we're we want to be able to provide um, solar for every for every um, congregation. Peter, do you happen to know what the commercial rate is for the Holland Muni? I don't personally live in Holland, but I'm mm -hmm. guessing somewhere around ten cents. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, live so in, mm -hmm. I have a municipally owned. I live in Zealand, which has a municipally owned power plant also. Mine's like 6.3 cents per kilowatt hour. Wow, goodness. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. So what other questions do we have in the room? You know, as, as folks are thinking about what else they might like to ask, I am, one of the things I, I thought was notable about what Henderson shared of Trinity AME's experience was that it took them one year to do the project. Um, and I'm we've got Jim Detchen in the room um, who attends Edgewood United Church um, in the Lansing area. And uh, when we first started talking about solar with Edgewood back in 2014 or 15, um, you know, it was taking congregations two or three years from soup to nuts, but when they started thinking about solar and investigating it and doing all the research to when it got, when they raised the money and got it installed. So the fact that, that we could have a congregation who, and congregations are not moving fast, right? We all know this. Um, if they can do, if they can get it done in one year, that's actually, um, that's actually pretty quick. And I think, you know, it, it could even happen faster if, if you kind of, um just kind of are are in have some momentum around around the decision that doesn't even have to take that long anymore. Jim, do you remember these days back when there was this huge burden of like investigation and research and talking to peers? Jim, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I think really we started looking about 2014 or so into this and it was a, it was a slow process because we were, we were an early adapter and, uh, but we, even then we were working with Michigan IPL. There were a few other churches in the state that we contacted and, uh, and so, yeah, um, I mean, for us, it's, it really has been very successful and we are now, uh, considering putting more another we put 70 solar panels on the roof and now we're actively looking into putting additional ones on with uh, the the broader goal that we're working on is can we totally decarbonize our church can we totally get away from all fossil fuels can we totally electrify it 
and have zero carbon emissions. That will take that will take a while, but we are uh, we're actively looking at the various things we could do, and and definitely putting on most more solar panels will be a key part of that. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. Yeah, I think that Edgewood is once again in the vanguard of kind of considering these questions and figuring it out. And luckily, the rest of us get to draft behind their leadership. Leah, I have a question for Jennifer. Uh, it goes, goes back to uh, the rebates. Now, Jennifer, you talked about some, some rebates and one of those rebates was, was uh, being in a low-income community. <clears throat> Does any of those rebates apply to uh, systems that have already been in, or is this something that you would have to start from scratch to apply for those rebates? Say, for, well, say, I, for, instance, say for instance, our system is already in, and uh, it's, it's uh, funded by an outside entity. So would we qualify to apply for a rebate? Well, my understanding, Henderson, because you did your your project was installed in the fall of last year. That was while this legislation was in process that your uh, all of the rebates that Trinity was eligible for are already baked into your project. Is that right, Rob? Yep. Okay. Yep, and, and and for those who haven't done a project yet, the um, the low income adder needs to be approved prior to construction, and so and so there is a map, and then you can determine whether you qualify or not. Then you apply for it, and as as Jennifer said, it's a lottery, and then once that's approved. Now they've expanded this the program quite a bit because the federal government has great interest in um, in supporting uh, the Justice Forty, which is they want to have forty percent of these incentives um, apply to low income communities, and that's where this additional incentive comes from. And so there's it is it is a really important sort of shift in the way in which um, uh, incentives and uh, their application uh, are happening. I have another question for you, Rob. Sure. Uh, being that it's an election year, uh, do you think that it's a possibility that uh, some of the uh, rebates and incentives will be Will be cut out for programs such as, as uh, the ones that we're talking about. Um, depending upon the results of the election, it's possible. But the um, Congress has not eliminated renewable energy incentives any year that's been at, it's been discussed in Congress. It is a sort of a poison pill for uh, for legislators to um, uh, in, in, include, you know, and so it is, uh, if they did want to eliminate it, it would take two to three years to actually defund the incentive because it has to go through the budget process, which is a year ahead and then the implementation side. So uh, yes, it's possible, it's not likely, and uh, it would take a while if, they, if it did. Thank you. And the incentive right now, uh, the IRA goes through 2032. And so for a lot of Congress, eh, they'll just let it sunset and then they won't support additional funding. So. For those of you that are interested, we should be really looking at the window between now and 2032 to get the best economics for these projects. Okay, that's good to know. <clears throat> yeah. Um 
Rob, I know that you're dialed into like an interesting disparity in terms of solar adoption by businesses versus solar adoption by communities of faith. Um, I just bring that up because we have a few minutes left and it's a really interesting disparity. I wonder if you could speak to it and maybe it's uh, another another reason, another thing to help people kind of stand up and take action. Yeah, uh, right now um, houses of worship around the country um, are only have uh, chosen to go solar about um, one in 20 houses of worship. And in uh, the regular commercial building, it's about uh, 3%. So, sorry, it's about 0.5% for um, houses of worship and about 3%, a little over 3% for commercial buildings. And it's, I think that a, a lot of the driver there is that um, houses of worship, uh, don't have free capital that they, or when they have free capital, they use it for their mission and that they typically don't like to borrow money. And so it's, it creates a financial barrier to, to doing these projects. And that's a real reason why Solar Faithful was organized and was to create an opportunity to put together one, the technical expertise with the congregations, and then two, the money when if a congregation can't do it themselves. Yeah, so that's a big difference, right? 0.5% of all houses of worship have gone solar compared with 3% of businesses. Both of those numbers are too small, but especially the house of worship number. Yeah. And so our hope is that we, right now, there's about 60 or 65 houses of worship in Michigan out of the 9,500 in Michigan. Uh, and so we're at something like 0.7%. Um, and we're hoping to get to the 300 or 3% um, in the next three years. Heck yeah. It's an ambitious vision. Peter, another question from you, please. Oh, or not. Yeah, we need you to un unmute, Peter. Sorry about that. I'm going to get a t-shirt that says unmute yourself. <laughs> um, if a congregation chooses to work with Solar Faithful and take advantage of their investor, mm -hmm. does that then mean that all of the necessary documentation and work to capture incentives would be addressed by the investor. Does the Absolutely. church have any responsibility or, or workload related to documenting and all that sort of stuff? No, the, the Solar Faithful takes on all of it. It takes on permitting, interconnection, the uh, application for the incentives, including the low-income community incentives, um, and by Solar Faithful doing many projects at once, we're able to also offer sort of uh, a, a the lowest price um, for the um, equipment. It's sort of a community buying because all of these um, houses of worship are, are getting them together. Does that address your question, Peter? Yes, it does. Yeah, good question. So if that were the case as a congregation, my only obligation would be to sit back and turn on the light switch. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I would have one additional request of you, Peter, which is to tell all your friends. <laughs> Well, it feels like we are coming to a natural end to our conversation. So thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Henderson, for sharing about your experience. And thanks, um, Rob and Steve, for coming for Solar Faithful. Jennifer, for your capable presentation. We are here. Um, we're here to answer your questions. And we hope some of you will, you know, sign our, in sign our interest form to find out more.
Right. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.